Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Uh, delighted to have you all here with us during the Christmas season. Um, hope you all are further along with Christmas presents than I am. Um, hey, before we get started, of course, we're going to open up in prayer, um, but I just want to remind you uh, of the um, uh, the chat box uh, to the right of your screen. Um, if you would, in the beginning, just go ahead and um, sign in your name and your location so that everybody knows uh, who's participating today. And we will also utilize that at the end for Q&A. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you uh, for uh, this Christmas season. We thank you for the birth of your son, Christ, and uh, just the the that he came to this earth uh, to uh, serve as a savior and uh, just to save us from our sins. God, we just thank you for this uh, forum. We thank you um, for um, Eric Kramer being with us today. Just speak through him and, and uh, just bless this time in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, uh, just delighted to have uh, Eric Kramer um, here with us today. Um, Eric um, is very experienced. He'll be ex uh, speaking to us today about opioid minimizing uh, acute pain control in low resource settings. Before he gets started, um, Eric um, is extremely qualified. Um, he has his doctor of nursing anesthesia practice. He's also a CRNA and uh, a family nurse practitioner. Um, Eric has served as a medical missionary in Mexico at Mission Taramara. I had uh, the pleasure of um, visiting with him there at that uh, compound. Um, and there he provides, uh, or he, he provided anesthesia. He was served as a hospitalist and worked in the ER. Additionally, um, Eric has extensive short-term uh, missionary experience, including deployments with Samaritan's Purse uh, a DART um, at the Iraqi Field Hospital just outside of Mosul in um, 2017. And he's also served during the DRC Ebola response. Uh, Eric currently resides in Ohio uh, where he serves on the faculty for Case Western Reserve um, and their nursing anesthesia program. So again, we're just delighted to have uh, Eric today as he speaks about opioid minimizing acute pain um, control in low resource uh, settings. Eric, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. It's uh, super rad to be able to talk about a topic like this. I've been really interested in this, uh, especially in the context of missions for quite a while. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is two basic things. First of all, we're just going to do a brief overview of nociception, which is pain sensation and transmission, kind of the different things and mechanisms that go into how that works, uh, because then that'll lay a foundation for why we're able to talk about kind of a multimodal attack uh, on pain uh, in the ER and hospital setting that doesn't necessarily require opioids because a 21st century understanding of pain control is a lot different than it was uh, even a few years ago, but we're really using a lot of the same tools when maybe we have some different options, especially when we're talking about missions. Uh, next slide, please. But before I even get into that, I just wanted to make the case for perhaps uh, why we're not prioritizing pain as much as maybe we should be on the mission field. And I myself have been guilty of this and uh, kind of came to this conclusion after some self-reflection. Um, when I first started long-term missions, I encountered what I can kind of describe uh, as a poverty of resources mentality that's kind of encapsulated in the idea of this is a missions hospital. We just don't have a lot of resources. This patient's here to get their gallbladder fixed or their leg fixed. So that's what we're going to focus on. And then pain control is kind of this tertiary idea. And it, this is kind of supported by statements like no one ever died from being in pain. Or another one that I've heard all over the world is these people are used to pain. They're tougher than Americans. We don't see them whining and complaining like Americans do. Uh, so they just don't need the same kind of pain control. And despite that, we know that physiologically human beings are the same. They have the same systems in their body that report pain the same way. Uh, it's just cultural and interpersonal differences that might make that expression a little bit different. And I think this is especially important for uh, uh, Christian missionary uh, healthcare providers um, who are trying to express Jesus's love by being the hands and feet of Jesus, because um, not only do you need to express that, but you need to do it in a way that the person will be able to receive and understand what you're trying to do. And the argument that I wanna make here is that pain erects a wall that prevents that from, being, from happening. Uh, and what do I mean by that? 
if we look at a definition of pain, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. What that means is not only do you have this noxious stimulus that uh, is uncomfortable, but your body is also sending signals to you saying that you're in danger, that you're receiving harm, that you're receiving permanent maybe injury, that you may be, your life may be threatened. And on top of all that, you have this dichotomy between uh, being kind of this, uh, the people that are being served and the people that are not from the country in the missions hospital setting who have power over them, who are from a much different culture that further adds to this anxiety and uh, fear and so on and distrust. Um, there's been a lot of studies done about people in pain and people in pain are not able to do a lot of abstract thinking or reason through complex ideas because their entire experience is focused on that uh, existential thing that is pain, right? Trying to deal with it, handle it, trying to get rid of it. And so if you as a physician or a healthcare provider come to someone who's in pain and treat pain as like this tertiary thing, uh, but you want to express Jesus's love to them, they're not going to even be able to comprehend where you're coming from because their mind is not there. Their mind is on the pain experience they're having. I want to put forth this idea here that pain relief penetrates language and cultural barriers to express Jesus' love in action with an immediacy that's unique within medicine and missions. I saw that nowhere more clearly illustrated than Iraq at the uh, uh, EFH, the, the field hospital, where you have Samaritan's Purse volunteers, Christian volunteers, and in some cases, ISIS prisoners of war. The, I can't think of a greater cultural and ideological chasm. Um, and despite that, uh, those DART volunteers were enabled to in many cases penetrate all that entire chasm with the simple act of providing pain relief and bringing down that wall and laying the groundwork for reaching out further to people, um, which is really what is talked about in Matthew 5, uh, 43 through 45, which is written so eloquently on the wall of this blast shelter in the EFH underneath Pray for ISIS that we're supposed to be active in our love for our enemies, right? And not just our enemies, uh, God says in uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, that God is described as someone who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. The word comfort in Hebrew is nechama, which is easement and rest to a troubled, suffering soul. And what a blessing and a privilege it is as a healthcare provider to have the tools and the capabilities to be able to provide rest an easement to a, a troubled suffering soul, lowering that barrier that pain erects, and then uh, at simultaneously making a bridge uh, that allows for further connections and interactions. Uh, next slide, please. So let's go over kind of some basics of nociception, again, which is pain transmission and sensation and its neuromodulation. This is a very basic overview. Uh, we have some receptors that are involved alpha, beta, which is touch and pressure, which can be converted to nociceptive uh, it, it, if enough uh, qualifications are met. We have thermoreceptors that can also be converted. These te uh, detect temperature. Alpha delta is your myelinated axons. These provide that initial sharp cutting pain that you feel. For example, if a bee stings you, um, your hand localizes right to where that bee sting is, right? You can touch right to that spot. That's because of those alpha delta initial pain response fibers. And then after a few hours, that sharp sting goes away, but you have this larger area that's throbbing and painful. This is from C fibers, which are these slower unmyelinated axons, which are the majority of pain fibers. They provide more of this diffuse, unlocalized pain that's kind of visceral. Visceral means kind of like if you have a stomach ache or something, you can't really point to one specific location and it lasts a long time. Next slide. Uh, there's four phases in this nociceptive process. The first one being transduction. Transduction basically means translating the injury itself, which may be a chemical thing. It may be stabbing, blunt, whatever. Say you have a, a, a needle that sticks into someone's hand, translating that action into an electrical impulse that's translated to your brain. That's what nociceptors do. Uh, nociceptive receptors. They translate that initial stabbing into an electrical signal. Uh, and additionally, at the same time, damaged cells, depending on the kind of injury that it is, release a lot of uh, inflammatory mediators, cytokines, uh, prostaglandins, different kinds of things that further wind up and amplify this response. At the same time, the nociceptors, which are starting to fire kind of like a, a heartbeat pacemaker fires, right, like this, 
release their own uh, mediators that are called uh, substance P and uh, calcitonin gene related peptide that increases the frequency and response of these pain signals and also recruits other nociceptors from surrounding healthy tissue to also start firing. It's kind of like one voice shouting something's wrong and then recruiting a bunch of other voices to also shout something's wrong to make the body aware. And you'll see this in practice when you, again, when you have a single sharp point of pain that especially spreads to a large area of sensitive tissue that isn't directly involved. This is called allodynia. Second phase is called transmission. So you have this uh, impulse that's generated and then it travels down three different neurons, first, second, and third order neurons. The first order neuron heads from the periphery, from the initial insult to the spinal cord to an area of the posterior spinal cord called the substantia gelatinosa, where it innervates with the second order neuron. So the first order neuron comes in, neurotransmitters jump from the first order neuron to the second order neuron, and then it heads up the spinal thalamic tracts of the spinal cord to the thalamus and uh, stops at the thalamus. From there, the second order neuron interfaces with the third order neuron, which spreads out to what's called the somatosensory cortex. If you recall from neuroanatomy from school, uh, that's the mapping of the brain that tells you where all the sensory uh, dermatomes are located in your body. And at that point, once that third order neuron hits the somatosensory cortex, you get perception of pain. That is your awareness of pain and then all the things that go along with that. At this point, the body does a couple different things, broadly speaking. It either tries to amplify the signal and make it more intense or do things to bring it down and make it less intense. This is done through several different mechanisms, um, both at the brain level and then at the brainstem level heading on down. What we're interested in this talk today is what happens with what's called the descending analgesic pathway that heads back down the spinal cord to that same place where the first and second order neuron interface, what's called the substantia gelatinosa, because there's a lot of stuff that goes on there and we're gonna take a closer look at that. Next slide uh, to see uh, what happens. So normally I have a laser pointer kind of thing to help me out with this, but on the right, you have a picture of uh, the whole pain process. And if you see someone's been stuck by a nail there's been damaged cells which are releasing the cytokines and the infl inflammatory mediators. Um, and that signal is heading up that first order neuron. And you can see that butterfly shaped object that's inside the spinal co uh, cord. And that posterior part of the spinal cord, the substantia gelatinosa, there's that interface between the two, right? And, you'll, uh, and then it heads up, but you'll notice now next to it, there's this red pathway heading down. And it's also in that same area of the substantia gelatinosa. This is the uh, descending analgesic pathway. And this is kind of an inhibitory pathway that regulates how many of those impulses from the first order neurons get across to the second order neurons. Um, so let's take a bit of a look at the different uh, neurotransmitters and modulators that play a role in this. We have, first of all, prostaglandins, um, which again are released as part of the injury. They're key in impulse propagation uh, and initiation and windup of the inflammatory process. Uh, one of the medications we're very familiar with, with, which are NSAIDs, work heavily on prostaglandins. So it's not just the inflammatory process that uh, NSAIDs hit, but also impulse propagation. Uh, and then we have glutamate. This is the primary neurotransmitter for alpha delta. However, if you leave pain undertreated or untreated and you have prolonged C fiber firing, uh, you'll get a release of glutamate, which binds to NMDA receptors. NMDA receptors are excitatory receptors that amp up the uh, impulses of pain and increase the impulses of pain. So anything that blocks uh, NMDA receptors decreases that. Anything that excites NMDA receptors amps that up. So when you have glutamate amping up these NMDA receptors, you get increased sensitization, increased depolarization, increased sensation of pain, and something that's called central sensitization. Uh, interestingly, this also glutamate decreases the efficacy of opioids over time. Uh, and this is independent of other tolerance, opioid tolerance mechanisms. Substance P, I already mentioned briefly in the other slide, substance P is released by nociceptive receptors at the site of injury to excite other nociceptors. It is also the primary neurotransmitter for substance uh, or C fibers. And it is released by that first order neuron uh, as the initiator of the second order neuron. It's like when you're thinking of a relay 
race, it's the baton that starts the second order neuron off. And so there's this thing called gate control theory, where you have these substances that can inhibit the first order neuron from releasing substance P and, and initiating the second order neuron from going. Um, so there's a few substances that particularly we're interested in when it comes to pain control. The first one is GABAmina butric acid or GABA. It's inhibitory between the first and second order neurons, which means that it'll bind to the end of that first order neuron and prevent or decrease the amount of substance P that's released. And that means that there's less signals firing up that second order neuron to the brain. Uh, another one is norepinephrine, serotonin, there's others. It's also interesting to note here that there are uh, accessory pathways that go into the substantia gelatinosa, that same place, and uh, that are stimulated by non-narcotic, non-opioid kind of mechanisms. For example, if you hit your head on a wall and you get a sore spot and you rub it, that sensation of rubbing and pressure from mechanoreceptors in your skin gets transmitted to these uh, uh, afferent uh, sensory neuron fibers in the substantia gelatinosa, which will release GABA and prevent substance P from being released and heading up to the second order neuron. In a nutshell, that's why rubbing your head kind of uh, helps a little bit with pain because it actually decreases pain impulses up that second order neuron. And calfins, endorphins, dynorphins, these are those naturally occurring opioid analogs that people like to talk about. They're also inhibitory. They block substance P from being released or reduce it. Uh, however, they are just a fraction of the potent potency of the uh, stuff we create as pharmaceuticals. Next slide. Nar uh, next slide. Narcotics, uh, we know, are divided into different kinds. We have the, uh, and they mostly attack the mu, delta, and kappa agonists uh, in that substantia gelatinosa, although there's other parts of the body they affect too. Mu is the primary mechanism of pain relief for most narcotics. Um, unfortunately, it's also the receptor that's responsible for most of the side effects, which we've become ex exceptionally aware of with the opioid crisis, which has really hit, especially here in Ohio. Um, the way it works is when a narcotic binds to a mu receptor, it prevents the presynaptic release of excitatory neurotransmitters like substance P in the dorsal horn. There's a multitude of side effects with this. We all know about respiratory depression. An interesting newer finding is hyperalgesia. Say you have a patient with seven out of pain, you give them some fentanyl, 45 minutes they'll, uh, the fentanyl wears off and they'll report an eight out of 10 pain. This is an exaggerated example, but uh, it can cause some hyperalgesia and increased sensation of pain after the pain medication wears off. Dependence, nausea and vomiting, there's all these issues. One thing I wanted to mention about the missions hospital setting, aside from difficulties that it seems that we sometimes have obtaining controlled substances in foreign countries, just because we're a missions hospital doesn't mean we're free from the risks of narcotic abuse. Um, I feel that sometimes there's this idea in missions hospital that since we're a Christian hospital, it's not gonna affect us like it does other hospitals. And I'm here to say that it is a risk anywhere where there's human beings. In Mexico, I actually had a family practice physician who was stealing fentanyl from my lock blocks for uh, months before I found him down in the bathroom floor uh, with a SATA 35 choking on his own vomit. It's a serious issue. And it is something that I think if you're thinking about narcotics in a hospital, you need to be um, uh, considering those aspects as well. Next slide, please. So let's dive into some of uh, the medications I've successfully used in the missions hospital setting. If you, and I remember having this conversation with Dr. Plyler years ago. Um, if you have, take a walk away with one thing from this talk, let it be from nalbufene or Nubane. It is really an amazing drug for acute pain control. And here's why. It is pre predominantly a kappa agonist with a mu antagonist. And we just learned from the previous slide that mu antagonism is what causes respiratory depression and other issues. Uh, it is one-to-one -one equipotent with morphine. So you can kind of dose it like morphine in pediatrics. The interesting thing about it, and this is both a blessing and a curse of it, is that it has a therapeutic and analgesic ceiling at about 0.3 to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. So this means that for really bad acute pain, you're going to have to add uh, something else on top of it. However, there's been some studies done, and what's really fascinating about Nubane, and I highlighted the uh, uh, reference here, the, the pertinent point here, they did a meta-analysis of a bunch of uh, 
uh, studies and looked at a bunch of patients that received Nubane and look at this highlighted portion, even a tenfold accidental overdose did not result in clinically re relevant respiratory depression. It is an incredibly safe, and this was in pediatric patients. It's very safe. It's pregnancy category B. It's uh, commonly used in labor and delivery for ladies that don't want epidurals so they can get through that second stage of labor. And crucially for missions, hospitals and accessibility, it is not a controlled or scheduled substance. It was taken off in 1973. It was originally a scheduled two. So it's cheap and it's easily available and you don't have to go through a lot of the legal hoops you do with other medications. And it really does work in a lot of ways like uh, um, morphine. So it's good for mo uh, mild to moderate pain. Uh, you can also run this as an infusion, which I've done on uh, burn patients with a great deal of success. Um, I have a table up there that kind of outlines that. Uh, next slide, please. Another partial agonist. Uh, now, this isn't an agonist antagonist like uh, Nubane, but partial agonist is butorphanol or statol. It's also used a lot in OB. Um, it is a strong kappa, but it is a weak mu agonist. So you still can run into some of the same issues as you get uh, with respiratory depression. So you have to keep kind of an eye on it, but it's really not too big of an issue. It's four to seven times as potent as morphine. So you really drop your dosage down. It has a bit of a slower onset, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, it has a decent duration of action though. Uh, it is pregnancy category C. Nonetheless, it is still used commonly in OB. The only issue I have with this medication, it's schedule four. So it can be a little more difficult to get uh, versus uncontrolled Nubane. Uh, next slide, please. Methadone is a really interesting drug that I've used a handful of times in the hospitalist setting and quite a bit in the anesthesia setting. And anesthesia will actually use these uh, IV in complex spine cases and it has an amazing amount of pain control. Uh, but really when you think of methadone beyond that, it's used in methadone clinics for heroin addicts and there's a lot of interest in it for palliative medicine. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why it hasn't been widely adopted for acute pain. First of all, though, it is a mu and delta agonist. However, unlike other narcotics, it is centrally acting NMDA antagonist. So you get this extra bonus of NMDA antagonism with some added pain relief that you don't get from other narcotic medications. Um, so that makes it useful for not only nociceptive acute pain, but also neuropathic pain, that, which is maladjusted chronic pain syndromes or something like that. Um, there's a lot of literature on its potency and it varies wildly all over the place. The important thing to understand when you're reading that kind of stuff is uh, most of that is comparing it to uh, 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 narcotic dependent patients. In the opioid naive patient, it's four times as potent as morphine. It's onset is six to eight minutes. The really good thing about it, it has a long duration of action. So you can kind of run it almost as like a basal medication, like pretend you're running a, a PCA or something like that, and then maybe have something for acute pain breakthroughs on top of it. Um, I've had it uh, run be effective for up to 24 hours. Uh, and that's one of the blessings and the curses of this particular medication. It, it can have a lot of patient uh, variability. Um, the issue with this is it has a very long elimination half-life, and this is why it's kind of not grown into wider acceptance for acute pain. Uh, you'll notice that chart on the right with repeated dosing, the serum levels keep rising and rising and rising and rising. And after about three to five days, you get into toxic ranges where early studies found people were at the highest risk for overdose and death and severe respiratory depression. So the way I've used this uh, in the field is to keep it to one to two days IV. And really for IV medication, usually that's about all you need. Um, and you can start uh, dosing it pretty conservatively, one to two and a half milligrams IV every eight to 12 hours, and then adjust the dosing as necessary up to five milligrams at a time. Uh, the only, I mean, and with a little bit of education, this kind of thing goes a long way. Uh, you really need to just start keeping your eye out for those signs of drowsiness and over sedation and so on that you'd see with any kind of narcotic overdose. And again, that usually starts after serum levels have built up over a, a few days. I don't do PO dosing of this medication, even though it's commonly available because of the abuse potential and because uh, I feel like uh, there's better uh, PO forms of pain control than narcotics uh, for most patients. Um, so I tend to avoid it, uh, even though it has a high bioavailability of, I think like 80% or something like that. Uh, so this is an interesting option and it's, I think kind of underused, especially in low resource mission settings. Uh, next slide. Ketamine right now is a favorite one for, uh, emergency room use, especially, um, 
It is an NMDA receptor antagonist. It's a super powerful analgesic. It has sedative properties. There's a reason why this is a favorite in uh, burn units when people are doing dressing changes and they're scrubbing the heck out of people, you know, uh, uh, to, to get the skin off. Um, it's useful when uh, respiratory or cardiac depression is a concern. Uh, it's gotten so popular in the ER, not only just for uh, sedation for procedures, but also as a primary pain control tactic that some consensus guidelines were released recently on the use of intravenous ketamine infusions, as well as bolus dosing uh, for acute pain management uh, from different societies who uh, know what they're talking about. So when we're talking about ketamine for acute pain, we're talking about sub anesthetic doses. These are doses that don't cause ketamine's famous dissociation. Um, and when we're using them in these doses, they can be used uh, really successfully uh, based on several clinical trials for acute pain control. They can be used as the sole agent or as part of a multimodal therapy. Um, and as a side note, they've also been successfully used in treating refractory major depression and chronic pain. Uh, on the lower right, you have a patient of, uh, I treated uh, with a serial ketamine infusion. She had a frozen shoulder and a chronic pain syndrome uh, that extended down to her finger. She hadn't moved her arm in years. And then after a bunch of ketamine infusions, she was able to freely move her arm. Um, the, the big issue with ketamine is dysphoria and hallucinations, which uh, honestly just increases lengths of stay if it happens. However, that incidence is highly variable. This is supported by the literature. It's really patient dependent. It's not pegged to a specific dose. So you might get one patient that it hits at like 20 milligrams and then one patient that's re receiving a, uh, an infusion and um, doesn't get anything at all. So uh, you, it's something you really have to kind of get a feel for and get comfortable uh, uh, doing, especially if you're running infusions on the floor as a hospitalist, which is something I've done uh, with a good deal of su success. If you start to use doses that are pretty high up to kind of um, anesthetic levels, hypersalivation can be uh, an issue. So you can pretreat with an anti silagogue like uh, atropine or glycopyrrolate. If you're going to bolus it, the guidelines recommend 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram slow IV push. My preference actually varies a little bit from that. I like to dilute 100 milligrams. Usually it comes in 100 milligrams in one ml. I dilute it into a 10 cc syringe. And then I give 10 milligrams or one cc at a time every five minutes up to 40 milligrams. It's a little bit easier to do that math. Um, and it's pretty effective at pain control. Uh, the studies have been mixed as far as need for rescue opioids after this, uh, but especially for uh, moderate pain and less, it, it's definitely an option. If you wanna try an infusion on the floor for say a burn patient or something like that, or someone with a severe amount of pain, you can start an infusion at 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram per hour. And the guidelines say you can titrate it up to one milligram per kilogram per hour. Something that I've done in the past is actually mix my ketamine into a hundred CC bag of magnesium, uh, which is also a uh, NMDA antagonist and has analgesic properties and uh, kind of run the magnesium as my carrier fluid. There's not a lot of literature supporting this practice, but there is literature supporting the running the two separately as separate infusions and running them in. Um, the point being that magnesium and ketamine are synergistic with each other. Uh, some relative contraindications with ketamine, severe heart disease, pregnancy, uh, especially in the first trimester, psychosis, moderate to severe hepatic dysfunction, elevated intraocular pressure and intracranial pressure. Uh, intraocular pressure, it actually doesn't change it that much. It's more the nystigmus that happens when you give ketamine that can be an issue, especially if you're trying to do ophthalmic related procedures. Uh, next slide. Lidocaine infusions are also something that in the anesthesia world are becoming more prevalent. And these are infusions that are running in recovery and also are being started to adopt uh, in hospitals on, on the inpatient side. Uh, so lidocaine is an amide local anesthetic. It inhibits sodium channels. We're used to lidocaine being something we inject subcutaneously when you're doing lacerations or something. Uh, however, as an infusion, it demonstrates significant analgesic anti-hyperalgesic, which means uh, uh, you won't get that uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia and anti-inflammatory properties. Normally when it's used, uh, it's used as an adjunct or complementary. It's not your primary method of pain relief. You used it to decrease overall opioid consumption. 
um, and kind of free up resources. If there's something that's cheap worldwide, it is bupivacaine and lidocaine. Lidocaine is an incredibly cheap medication. So this makes it a very viable option in a mission setting where you're trying to conserve more precious resources. Uh, it also uh, reduces the sensitivity and activity of spinal cord neurons. It decreases the depolarization of those neurons. And interestingly, it decreases NMDA postsynaptic depolarization. Uh, there's some studies that have shown that it actually decreases in uh, inflammatory markers in a clin clinically relevant way. Um, the way I normally do this is I start with a loading dose of about one milligram per kilogram, and then I'll run the infusion at one to two milligrams per kilogram per hour. What's cool about lidocaine is it doesn't take that long to achieve a steady state. Uh, it takes like four to six hours. And then it has a really short context sensitive half time. This means that if after say three days, if you discontinue the infusion, it'll be gone in like 20 to 40 minutes in healthy individuals. You obviously need to be concerned about people who have hepatic and uh, renal insufficiency. This is highly dependent on your portal uh, venous flow for metabolism. Uh, but if you have a healthy patient, this is uh, really a good option. One drawback of lidocaine infusions, it's got a pretty narrow therapeutic index of 2.5 to 3.5 micrograms per ml, and CNS toxicity starts at five. Um, there's something called LAS, which is local anesthetic toxicity syndrome. There's different stages of this, uh, starting with circumoral numbness, like a metallic taste, like you're sucking on a penny, tinnitus, ringing of the ears, lightheaded dizziness. Those are all kind of mild signs of lidocaine toxicity. A patient that's getting a, ketamine or a lidocaine infusion might experience that lightheadedness. Um, muscle twitching, unconsciousness, and seizures are really advanced in someone who's really deep in. Honestly, I've only really seen that with intravascular injection of massive amounts of local anesthetics, say if you're doing a nerve block or something like that. Uh, the other thing to think about with this is it does tend to prolong the PR interval in certain patient populations. So if you have someone with arrhythmias or cardiac issues, you want to keep an eye on that as well. Maybe throw them on an EKG. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to briefly mention NSAIDs here. We're all super familiar with them uh, and just highlight a couple points that might you can maybe consider in your practice. So we all know that uh, NSAIDs uh, prevent uh, COX-1 and COX-2. COX-1 is the one that kind of affects the gastrointestinal lining of your stomach. So when you use an NSAID, that prevents that gastric mucosa from uh, really producing the mucus it needs, which is why you get gastric ulcers with, say, ibuprofen, right? And that's also why they develop the COX-2 specific ones that don't block COX-1. Um, and that traditionally has limited the use of Toradol in certain patient populations, um, patients that may be high risk for gastric ulcers or something. Um, what I wanted to point out here is there was this really interesting, well done RCT recently uh, for, in the ER field that showed that uh, a low dose 10 milligrams of IV Toradol was analgesically just as strong as 30 milligrams. So there's an analgesic plateau that you hit with Toradol uh, at 10 milligrams. The trade off for that is that you have to dose it more frequently. However, there's a significant reduction in the side effects. Uh, uh, associated with uh, giving IV Toradol so that you're able to use a lower dose and maybe expand that patient population a little bit. The other thing I wanted to remind you guys of, especially when you're thinking about alternatives to narcotics, is that Tylenol and ibuprofen can be taken together. They're synergistic with each other. And the way I normally do that is I'll pair the Tylenol up with the ibuprofen dosing and give both at the same time. Uh, two to 600 of ibuprofen and 650 of Tylenol Q8 hours, it also dramatically decreases the amount of narcotics you're gonna need. Um, I also wanted to mention paracetamol. It took me longer than I want to admit to figure out what the heck paracetamol is. It is available worldwide, IV and PO. It is just Tylenol. It's dose like Tylenol. It is a high level of bioavailability. I think it's like 70% 70, 70 PO to IV. And it's super cheap, it's super effective. It's just Tylenol, use it. Uh, uh, it's something that I think isn't incorporated enough, especially the IV stuff. Uh, metamazole is another bizarre drug that I just wanted to throw on here for those of you guys that might be working in Latin American countries. It is this really strange NSAID-like pain reliever that was banned in the United States for causing agranulocytosis, but is commonly available in Latin American countries. IV and PO, it's dose like Tylenol. I never used it because I felt really uncomfortable with it, but it's out there if you have nothing else. Uh, next slide, please. 
All right, nitrous oxide. This is kind of a random one to bring up, especially for hospitalists and ER settings, but I want to kind of pose to you, uh, uh, perhaps you can consider that this is commonly used in dentist office, right? And uh, uh, if it's used in dentist office, why isn't it used more in ERs? Well, the answer with that, I think, is it's just kind of cumbersome to set up the equipment. It can be kind of labor intensive and it's not maybe part of the culture. However, nitrous oxide is actually very effective. It's available worldwide. Right now in the United States, it's pretty expensive. However, it's, 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 it's really not a big deal once you get a protocol set up for it. It's an NMDA antagonist, a GABA agonist, and it stimulates the release of uh, endogenous opioids. Uh, the sweet spot that we want is that the 50 to 70% concentration, it's usually mixed with oxygen. Then you get a lot of the analgesic properties and sed sedative properties that you're looking for. It's got a really quick onset, a really quick peak. And what's really nice in the ER setting is it's got a short duration of action. It isn't metabolized. You just breathe it off and it's let go. You can see on the right there some examples of nitrous being used in the ER for various procedures, a lac repair, placing a cast on a peds. There's a whole bunch. I mean, the sky's the limit with using nitrous as far as procedural sedation instead of IV sedation. You know, for minor procedures, instead of putting a kid through starting an IV, you could do nitrous just like they do it in the ER and then do what you got to do. Uh, I've used this a lot and I found it to be incredibly effective um, and underused. It's also pretty safe. This is another thing that on labor and delivery floors, women will use during the second stage of labor um, if they don't want to get in a, a, an epidural. Uh, there's some side effects. The main one I want to point out is vitamin B12 deficiency. If you have an, someone who's had multiple miscarriages, you should suspect that maybe they have an MTHFR deficiency, which is an issue with uh, vitamin B12 metabolism. Uh, and so you do not want to give those people uh, nitrous oxide. You don't want to give it early in pregnancy, the first trimester of pregnancy, when vitamin B12 is super important. You also don't want to give it to anyone that has like a pneumothorax or a bowel obstruction, COPD, sinus or ear infection. The common thing with all of those is they have an enclosed airspace that cannot expand. So what you get is nitrous diffuses across easily and increases pressure inside those areas. So for example, with a pneumothorax, nitrous oxide will diffuse into that area and increase the size of the pneumothorax. Uh, so it's definitely something you want to avoid. Uh, next slide. Uh, I also wanted to bring up nerve blocks, and this is kind of my anesthesia background showing, um, but I really honestly believe that uh, nerve blocks are no longer for just for anesthesiologists and really not just for even for emergency physicians, especially in the mission setting. I want to put forward the idea that perhaps even hospitalists can use this as a primary method of pain control. And why is that? Well, uh, these days, it is incredibly easy to get your hands on a handheld ultrasound. Uh, I own several of them. This is one of them. This costs about $2,000. It's the Butterfly IQ. If you work in the ER, you've probably heard of it or in missions for any length of time. Um, and uh, nerve blocks are gaining rapid acceptance in the emergency room specifically. I think uh, one study showed that about 80% of residences teach their residents how to do them. Uh, Indwelling catheters can provide days and days or even weeks of pain relief. And there's really novel, easy to learn nerve blocks that provide some really effective uh, non-anesthesia related uh, treatments. For example, the erector spinae block, if you look um, that you can see the dermal tomal coverage of the erector spinae block there on the right in, that, in the green, it's pretty incredible. And what's really remarkable about this is it also covers visceral pain, not just dermatomal like sensory pain. So say for example, and I've done this, you have a patient on the floor that you're treating medically for an acute cholecystitis because you don't have a general surgeon to take it out. You can do a right-sided erector spinae block and take care of that visceral uh, gallbladder pain. And then they take no narcotics for the next day or two until the surgeon comes back and does the surgery or whatever. Same thing with appendicitis. Um, I've used the erector spinae block uh, for patients for pain control with uh, herpes out or shingles outbreaks. Um, it's really excellent for that. Um, you can use nerve blocks for frostbite and burns because not only does it provide pain relief, but it increases blood flow from the sympathectomy to the affected limb. Uh, venice mist bites. I remember once a, a violent, I think a violin spider or something. I can't remember. Maybe it was a snake bite. I did a, a, a popliteal block on uh, to provide total pain control. Migraines. Um, Another suit, you don't even need ultrasound for that. I do what's called a net neck meat injection, where I just stick a couple cc's of 
uh, a long acting bupivacaine on either side of the midline of the neck for migraine and it's pretty effective. Uh, so the bottom line is there's all kinds of reasons to maybe start thinking about nerve blocks in new ways that aren't just for anesthesia. It's easy to learn. I have no affiliation to any of these companies. These are just courses I've taken. And I recommend if you're, say, a hospitalist that's interested in maybe learning nerve blocks and applying them to these things, go to a cadaver class. Um, the one I took, for example, at Maverick uh, Education, it was all online. And then I went to a cadaver lab and for two days, we did nothing but stick needles in cadavers. That's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nerve blocks. I brought my own ultrasound. So I practice on the machine I'm gonna use. And uh, it gives you that motor memory uh, and makes you able to then go back to your place, uh, your hospital and perform those nerve blocks yourself. Uh, again, the era of it being this specialized thing that requires a fellowship and only certain people can do it, I believe is diminishing and uh, it's starting to kind of ooze across different specialties to gain a wider acceptance. Uh, next slide. I want to end on this note. This is the last slide in the presentation. Uh, just to mention that uh, opioid-free anesthesia, which is an anesthesia-specific thing, has really exploded over the years. Uh, in interest because of uh, the outcomes being so much better if people avoid using narcotics perioperatively. Um, but even outside of that, there's this organization called the Society for Opioid-Free Anesthesia, goopioidfree.com, has a ton of really useful resources that even if you're a clinician in the hospital or in the ER, if you'll notice in that post-op section, uh, there's a whole bunch of the things that we talked about and a whole bunch that we didn't talk about <coughs> that can be used as adjuncts that kind of may attack that pain pathway in different ways and by themselves may not reduce pain, but in conjunction with other things, bring down pain with, and limiting the amount of narcotics uh, that are used. So uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Plyler. Eric, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, awesome presentation. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think for so many reasons, um, name, namely the, uh, the epidemic uh, across America with regard to uh, narcotics, uh, opioids, um, and then just um, the um, in our um, mission hospitals um, where um, access is certainly a challenge. Um, I think uh, these innovations, these non-narcotic innovations, are something that we should definitely consider, and um, um, it's something that yeah we just don't look at enough. So thanks so much for uh, making us more aware of these opportunities. Um, I'm holding out for questions here, but um, I will, I'll just start off with um, one comment is, um, I love what you said about um, nerve blocks. And um, I think with the, uh, you know, um, these handheld ultrasounds are, are just becoming more and more prevalent. And so I think there is greater opportunity for, um, you know, non uh, anesthesia providers uh, to, uh, to, to, utilize nerve blocks, something we certainly don't consider very much and uh, something that uh, I think we should. Um, well, it would be neat to, if we could offer um, some kind of course like this um, for uh, our viewing audience. Um, I don't know if we could arrange something like this at PFR uh, or, or anything like that, but I think- I'd be uh, happy to, I teach, I teach it all the time actually. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to definitely uh, do that, but- um, let me start off with question number one, Eric. Um, this is uh, from our good friend, Alan Sawyer. Yeah. Says, could, you, could you comment on your thoughts regarding scheduled dosing of NSAIDs versus PRN dosing for post-op uh, analgesia uh, within the first 24 to 72 hours post-op? So Dr. Sawyer, uh, uh, OBGYN, who I met at the Ebola training conference um, uh, a while ago, I wanna say uh, actually something that I use for cesarean uh, sections uh, specifically uh, is uh, transverse abdominal plane blocks or tap blocks. They're super easy to use, uh, perform if you're the OBGYN doing them. Um, and usually after cesarean section, we only need Tylenol as a post-operative rescue uh, pain medication. That's just as an aside. Um, but uh, tap blocks are very effective for cesarean sections. With regards to NSAIDs, uh, I prefer to uh, uh, personally schedule the dosing uh, if there's no contraindications um, because uh, that provides more consistent, reliable pain relief and doesn't allow those therapeutic plasma levels to dip too low that you end up playing a little bit of catch up, especially if your goal is to do some kind of narcotic free anesthesia. I think scheduling it is better than PRN. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. 
Um, one other uh, question I, or one other comment I'll just make, um, and I don't know, um, it, it's not really a, uh, so much a question as is a comment. I, so many of these um, uh, medications, these alternative medications that you've described, I think a lot of them are institutionally dependent. So, you know, it's just people's comfort level. Like um, yeah. I know for the longest time, like I, I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't uh, very comfortable uh, with, um, Sorry, I'm blanking on uh, ketamine, um, but um, but I think it's just uh, at your institution, you know, what what everybody's kind of using, what's the the trend, and uh, I don't know if you have any comment about that, how you can maybe introduce some of these agents uh, to you know your mission hospital and 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 help people get more familiar and comfortable utilizing them. Yeah, that's actually an excellent question, um, especially with getting on board at an institutional level. Um, when uh, I remember when we first started in anesthesia, started really looking at opioid free, there's a lot of alternative agents that are really frankly off label use. One of the ones that's a prime example of that is IV clonidine, uh, which is normally an antihypertensive or a sleep right. aid, uh, but we would use it uh, uh, and substitute uh, clonidine for fentanyl entirely. So instead of giving say 100 mics of fentanyl on induction, we'd give clonidine. But in order to get the buy-in from pharmacy and the rest of administration and to develop a protocol, it really does take some time and effort. And I think uh, it takes one person. I, I remember there was this uh, uh, talk on uh, wound care, actually, a few years ago that I really enjoyed. And the, the surgeon that was talking talked about having taking ownership of the wound, right? And being the one that's responsible for it. And I feel it's the same way with these new ideas. Someone needs to take ownership of the ideas and be the champion for these ideas and be the steward of it to take it all these committees, develop the protocols. It's a lot of hard, thankless work, uh, mm -hmm. but I think in the end it pays off. Certainly in a lot of places, it's not, not just as easy as, hey, I have this bottle of medication. I'm gonna start pushing it in patients. You know, you do need to kind of show the evidence. Um, and I will say that all this stuff that I've talked about today does have a lot of evidence supporting it. So it's, it, it, there, is, there is things you can pull, you can do a quick lit review and bring it to your pharmacy or your, the committee that decides these kind of things at your particular institution to make your case for why it should be included. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, uh, uh, surprisingly, no other questions. The, the only, I, I'm a lowly internist, so uh, I, I will say one other just practical issue that just comes to my mind. I don't know if you can speak into, uh, given your experience in, in, in Mexico, can you speak into uh, maybe some uh, developing world um, uh, pharmaceutical, um, you know, uh, locations where we can access some of these alternative medications and then maybe just speak into uh, concerns for um, uh, for um, uh, drugs that are, are uh, illegitimate drugs, if you will. Yeah, that's that's another good question. Um, so everywhere I've ever traveled, if I have the opportunity, I kind of just do a casual inquiry in whatever um, uh, uh, pharmacy I might come across to kind of see what's available. And so from that, I've kind of pulled uh, kind of what seems to be the more common medications. That's actually why I pulled nitrous oxide because surprisingly, it seems like it's commonly available. The yeah. philosophy behind its use varies widely behind country. However, it is commonly available and it's easily accessible. Uh, same thing with some of these other games. Nubane and buprenorphine is another one that I didn't mention in this talk are ones that are fairly easy to, to obtain. Nubane more than buprenorphine. Uh, Nubane just because it isn't scheduled and generally countries follow the United States lead on those kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, there's one other question it looks like. Yeah, there's uh, a call. it looks like there's two here. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Jeff Subra. Jeff, good to have you on board here. Uh, he says, thanks, Eric. I just had rotator cuff surgery with nerve block and lidocaine um, ball for post-op pain. Uh, first hand understanding of what you presented. Uh, so I guess he's just um, commenting and um, so just uh, kind of confirms uh, what you're saying. Thanks so much. Uh, Karen Daniels. Karen, thank you for joining us today. Um, Let's see, she says, this is more anesthesia related, but can you speak, Eric, into the interface uh, between PTSD anesthesia with patients who live in conflict settings? Any experience with- um, Dextromatomidine, uh, yeah. That's actually a great question. Um, Karen, believe it or not, PTSD and ketamine go hand in hand. Uh, if I find out I, I'm treating, a, a, for example, a Marine who has PTSD, I will purposely give them 
uh, 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 ketamine during the anesthetic because their wake up is a lot smoother. Ketamine actually helps PTSD. It doesn't make it worse, which seems kind of counterintuitive. As far as dextromethamphetamine or Presidex, that's also another great tool. Um, I, because of time limitations, I didn't go over that as a, an option, but definitely either PRN uh, boluses, uh, five mics at a time, or infusions can be very useful. Actually, in anesthesia, we use those centrally acting alpha-2 agonists, clonidine and Presidex, um, as adjuncts uh, for uh, analgesia, intra and post-op. Very awesome. Okay, thanks so much. Um, Eric, I think that's uh, it in terms of questions. Um, uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, incredible presentation uh, with uh, an incredibly broad spectrum of, of, of understanding. Uh, and um, we really appreciate this. Um, I think uh, this is gonna have a lot of practical application uh, for us at Mission Hospitals and um, excited to see that uh, being implemented. Um, just a reminder to everyone, uh, with regard to CME credit, it is available uh, for this session, so please take advantage of that. Uh, remember also just our, um, our library of incredible presentations like Eric, um, you can get CME credit for those uh, recordings, so really encourage you to go to our site at health.samaritansfirst.org and take advantage of those CME opportunities and that, uh, uh, that great archives of uh, information. Um, our next webinar is going to be Wednesday, January 13th with um, Laurie Sauerwine. Um, she's a nutritionist and she will be speaking to us about malnutrition in hospital settings. So please uh, join us. Um, Eric, I hope you and your family have a great Christmas. I hope everyone else uh, also has just a great uh, Christmas. Thank you so much for joining and supporting um, Samaritan's Purse um, uh, International Health Forum. God bless and take care. All right, thank you. Appreciate it for the opportunity.